Hi everyone, my name is Paul Glick and today I'm going to be talking about embodied intelligence for extreme environments. I'm at the JPL, did my PhD back at UC San Diego, and as a little bit of extra background, I've actually gotten to put um, and work with robots in extreme environments uh, through work as an ROV operator down uh, with the Ocean Exploration Trust on the EV Nautilus. So as motivation that's gonna underpin projects that cover both my work at JPL and back at uh, my PhD work back at UCSD, um, talking a little bit about robotic exploration. So exploration is really fundamental to human nature, uh, but now at this point, many of our best explorers are actually robots. Sending humans into the field has always been a challenge. Um, humans require food, sleep, and generally the nice conditions that it takes to keep us alive and breathing. The benefit of robots is, of course, then that we can go to these extreme environments without uh, subjecting all the same level of environmental controls that we need for a human. Uh, here you see some examples of both past and present uh, human exploration um, with the Mercury 7 and the uh, Alvin, which is a deep sea um, human operated uh, submersible. But as you know, some of the challenges in these extreme environments uh, include pressure, temperature, and radiation, often to very extreme levels. There's an anecdote that at some point during uh, sending robots into Fukushima after uh, the incident there, the hardest part of that challenge was actually avoiding all the basically failed robots on the way in just due to the extreme radiation environment would fry a lot of the um, computers and, and components. So in the lab, we're spoiled. We have the best computers, the best sensors. They're plugged into a wall. We have nice environmental controls over the lab. and every um, So we get to do all these advanced and, and great things. Uh, in reality, in the real world, um, as you put things further and further out into the field, every sensor, every, sensor, every actuator, every computer uh, comes at a cost to the mission. That can be in terms of dollars. It can be in terms of mass. It can even be in terms of science return. If you have to heat an element versus use that same limited power to run your primary instrument, you potentially have direct uh, costs there. So all of this puts some uh, premium on simplicity. It motivates how can we look at pre-programmed structures, baking uh, intelligence into a mechanical design itself uh, to eliminate some of the need for fancy controls and um, all the best robotics that we often see in, in you know, more benign environments, um, how can we actually reduce the requirements on, especially along the extremities of a robot itself? So I'm gonna go over a few projects for my PhD research with an emphasis on soft robotics. Uh, you're all probably familiar with Hooke's Law, which is basically that the force is gonna be proportional to the stiffness and uh, displacement. For, so for a fixed force, there's this direct trade-off between your stiffness and displacement. Um, and I see this as a useful, though somewhat simplistic, approximation for the field of soft robotics itself. That there's typically this trade-off between strength and adaptability. So the stiffer a robot, you know, the higher loads it can support without deflecting, but therefore you have less room to actually comply and adapt with the environment itself. Um, and then the performance uh, is analogous to being you know, the combination of those two. Uh, so again, if you treat your stiffness as a linear approach, you're gonna have a fundamental trade-off here between strength and adaptability. Um, but if you look more at you know, how can we pattern and selectively choose where our compliance is, how can we then leverage both strength and adaptability to get both parameters and increase our overall performance in these extreme environments? The first project here, put very simply, is how do you grip things in space? Um, this is a fun uh, challenge, and fun being another word for difficult. Um, there's plenty of, of uh, complicating features here. A lot of spacecraft are smooth, non-ferrous. You can't use uh, magnetic approaches. You're in a vacuum, so you can't use any kind of suction, as well as having to avoid and be concerned about delicate uh, surfaces. Additional challenges include a lot, the fact that a lot of uh, objects and areas of uh, interest for gripping are featureless, and potentially some of the best applications in on-orbit uh, gripping, you potentially are dealing with unknown shapes and, and objects. Uh, you know, again, some of the best applications here are satellite service and repair, in-space inspection and maintenance, and then deorbiting space junk. Um, and in all those use cases, you potentially uh, don't know exactly what your target operations are going to be in advance. To look at this problem, we were uh, motivated to look at basically two complementary technologies. 
um, looking at both elastomeric, fluidic elastomeric actuators and then gecko-inspired adhesives. Um, they both offer some similar advantages and then uh, unique challenges and, and special specialization as well. Uh, so the soft robotic actuators offer compliance at a you know, fairly large size scale. Um, they have an innate ability to uh, be simply controlled yet adapt to um, the shape of the object that they're gripping. And similarly, a lot of the you know, fantastic gecko adhesive uh, research here um, has actually similar properties but at a different size scale. The ability to adapt to microscopic roughness and through that process um, exploit uh, van der Waal forces and wrap and engage um, and support high loads. Uh, but then they do offer each challenge as well. So gripping on, you know, again, for the soft robotics, any kind of strength uh, does present a challenge because you have that lack of stiffness. And then for the gecko-inspired adhesives, um, really, again, they work through this uh, van der Waal forces, which are um, weak intermolecular bonds. And so to get those, you have to rely on very close surface contact. Uh, so we looked at how you put these together and basically promote surface contact on an unknown object. Luckily, and to answer this question, we had a, a great pathway forward. Uh, Shigeo Hiroshi researched this topic back even in 1977, looking at how do you maintain or achieve uh, an even surface um, pressure distribution across an arbitrary object with a uh, continuum. And basically, making several assumptions. We're going to come back and look a little bit more at these assumptions later on. But for now, uh, we can just treat this as, as a good starting point. To achieve this goal, you basically need to have a, uh, a beam or, or actuator with a torque distribution as described in this profile um, through this equation on the bottom left. Uh, basically, this just means that your torque is going to be exponentially decreasing from the base to the tip of the uh, digit. So looking at how to apply this to the field of soft robotics, there were a lot of great models, and there still is a lot of great model development. Um, but most of the models were, if you take a design, then you can do work simulating and predicting what it will do. We wanted to go in the other direction, have a model simple enough that we could use it during our design phase to actually get the behavior that we were after, which again is that even uh, you know, prescribed torque distribution. So we treated this. Um, Basically, we looked at how can we make a model simple enough that we can use it in our design phase. Uh, and to do that, we basically idealize a fluidic elastomer actuator and assume that all of the torque is coming from these individual discrete joints that are um, occurring where the faces of two adjacent uh, joints are pushing together. And at that point, you basically can treat it as a pretty simple problem, where the torque is going to be the force times the distance of the moment arm, and then the force is going to be the pressure times the area. So really looking at simple math to solve a complex behavior. Um, to try to adhere to this model, we actually have to make and then design our robot to try to maximize these assumptions, which is assuming that the face is in contact, that the lever arm is a constant distance, and that the area is constant. As you'll see in this slide, there's, of course, uh, problems with this modeling approach. It's, it's far from perfect. Um, there's two main dependencies to cover. First is that there's a strong angle dependency. As you have joints that are separated by some angle, it takes further pressure and basically stretching of those faces to come into contact. And then uh, the second is just the pressure itself. So as uh, these faces are expanding, both their moment arm and area and contact are changing as well. So there's two main dependencies here, angle and pressure. Um, and you can see their impact. But uh, we thought, generally, this is not too far off. And let's look at what this looks like over the entire gripper. So again, the behavior that we're after is maintaining contact. And what you see here in this slide are two different uh, grippers, with it, the only real difference being the internal structure. On the top, in part A, you see a gripper that has you know, a uniformly distributed internal geometry. So each chamber is the same size as the next. Uh, and in the bottom, you see the gripper that has been designed to this torque profile using the model. And what you see is basically what you would predict, that as you inflate and increase the overall torque in the gripper on the top, um, the distal joints have enough torque, because they all effectively have the same torque. It has enough torque that it can then force off the rest of the finger 
um, and you lose that contact that's required for engaging the adhesives. Uh, in the bottom, you see that you're actually able to maintain this even as you increase the, the torque across the gripper. Um, we validate this through looking at the real surface contact area, which is done through a um, custom-built uh, cylindrical uh, frustrated total internal reflectance sensor. So basically, we have this edge-lit polycarbonate tube in a dark room, and using that, the only light that escapes is what's actually in contact with that surface. Then we looked at the behavior of the, and performance of the uh, gripper with the gecko-inspired adhesives as a whole. Um, you see a few interesting things. At all size scales, uh, the gripper performed better than uh, a, the similar one without the gecko-inspired adhesives. The other thing you see is a large dependence on the size of the object that you're gripping. So these adhesives have a very interesting property. Often we think of friction as being something that's load controlled. So the harder you squeeze it, the more frictional force you get. Uh, some of the you know, magic of these adhesives is that they actually have adhes adhesion controlled friction. So you don't have to squeeze an object to be able to get this high adhesive force. Um, and an inter interesting and great way to exploit this is by wrapping around an object uh, you're creating these frictional forces tangential to that object at all, at all points along contact. Um, so what this means is if you're trying to grasp a uh, cylinder right near the uh, middle point of the cylinder, you have more forces that are pointing upwards that can actually support vertical load. But as you get uh, closer and closer to the top of that cylinder, um, those forces are really pointing horizontally and you don't get much um, strength contribution from that. So there's this inherent size dependence um, when you're gripping something in this, in this way. The other thing you see on the right is we wanted to look at overall grasp options, performance, and versatility. Uh, so what, what does this kind of gripper enable? And we see that it enables grasps that you couldn't do with either um, technology before. So there are a lot of cases that we found that you have a hybrid grasp where one finger is providing a normal force or enclosure support, and then the other finger is doing this um, you know, surface adhesion and providing uh, strength that way. The next thing we did was we took our robot to the gym and saw how much it could lift. Um, we had both a two and three finger version that we uh, tested the maximum force on. Um, and a few interesting points here. So first, you'll see comparisons to some of the other uh, state-of-the-art grippers at the time. Um, and you'll see that the forces and loads that we support are similar, if not higher. Uh, and again, we're able to do this at low pressure. And that low pressure is key because um, it gives us two options, right? First is it maintains the flexibility of the grippers, that adaptation, which is the whole reason that we're pursuing this type of technology. And then the second is that um, it's scalable. So if you want to increase your uh, strength of the overall gripper, gripper, you need to scale your adhesive uh, area, not necessarily the pressure and stiffness that you're putting into it. The next project that we looked at is how do we scale this up in terms of size? Um, at this point, we were interested in gripping uh, entire satellites, again, for potential uh, capture and, and refueling. Um, you can imagine it's, it's much cheaper to potentially uh, refill a propellant tank than send up an entire new spacecraft. But capturing a uh, satellite at this scale potentially motivates, again, a, a larger size. And this had a few uh, new design drivers that we wanted to look at as well. So having something that was stowable and had sequential deployment, again, and the sequential deployment was towards being able to conform closely to an unknown surface. Uh, so first, I'm going to cover uh, how we did the sequential deployment. So here you're going to see the gripper uh, conforming to an arbitrary object. This was a spare mirror mount that we found lying around a lab. Um, and the way that we do this, you see it retracts the same in basically the reverse process. So this is a highly underactuated gripper. It, it looks quite different from the pneumatically actuated uh, version you just saw in the previous set of slides. Um, but there's actually only one actuator per linkage. So we have a single grip tendon running through this linkage connected to a series of pulleys. And then we have a passive retract tendon attached to a constant force spring uh, operating basically this, this retract. And you can see basically the, the simplified version on the right here is what these pulleys look like. So you have 
This retracts being providing a constant force and then uniform torque with all the pulleys the same size, uh, trying to torque each joint backwards into the stowed configuration. And then you have a monotonically decreasing uh, size pulleys on this grip side. And so as you provide more and more tension to this grip line, each link one at a time switches over from a net negative to a net positive torque and is going to rotate until it comes in contact with an object. Uh, if you remember that torque distribution that, that I mentioned earlier, um, there are a few assumptions that uh, were made to get that torque profile um, and to guarantee that, that surface contact. A few of those assumptions include a known contact location, ignoring surface friction, and ignoring angles between joints. So it's a great uh, set of math to derive that original equation. Um, but as you add you know, the real world and practical joints, and um, it gets quite difficult to make an infinite number of joints, as you can all probably imagine, uh, that some of that math does break down. And basically, this introduces um, a mathematical look at the stability of a gripper, where stability is defined on its tendency to push itself off a surface, as you um, saw from that uh, unsuccessful grasp in the previous figure. So in reality, um, the contact location and joint angle have a significant impact on stability. And the more joints you introduce, in, it often becomes harder and harder uh, to stabilize grass on unknown objects. And part of that is simply due to the practical challenges of packing an exponentially scaling torque profile into a you know, physical gripper with 10 plus joints. Um, there's one big thing going in our favor that already dovetailed really perfectly with the adhesive work that we were uh, already pursuing. Um, so again, we were looking at this gripper as a way to engage and contact a surface uh, and then engage the gecko-inspired adhesives. So how can we wrap around large arbitrary objects and then let the gecko-inspired adhesives do the work? Um, and this led us to an interesting result, which is that the surface friction has a large and positive effect on stabilizing uh, these grasps. Um, so there's a lot more math, but for the sake of brevity, I at least just want to show the results today. Um, here you can see uh, basically this behavior on the top left here. Um, a gripper right after the last link has come in contact, and you can see the force that we have in the grip and retract tendons. As we apply more force in the grip tendon, um, you see this loss of stability, and the gripper pushes itself off this flat surface. Uh, there are two approaches that you can take. One is just purely mechanical by scaling these forces, but keeping the torque profile the same. Um, you're able to maintain contact. The other is, again, by adding um, surface friction. So the, in the final uh, figure here, D, you see the impact of surface friction with a little bit of tension in the gripper overall. Um, provides a lot of extra stability, and we're able to um, you know, engage and torque down onto the surface at a much higher level without losing contact. You also see some of the nice benefits of this style of gripper. Uh, so because, again, it is quite compliant, gentle, um, its torque into the surface is not particularly high. Uh, it can wrap around arbitrary shapes without damaging them. We show that on gripping an arm. Uh, you can potentially wrap around non-continuous surfaces or reach non-adjacent objects um, by exploiting dynamics and actuating quickly. Um, you can actually choose whether or not you're going to do that sequential motion or engage multiple joints at a, at a single time. I'm now going to take a little bit of a departure and start talking about coral reefs and uh, growth as a robotic mobility process. Um, we started this this project, not just as a robotics project, but actually as an ecology project. We were approached by a group down at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography who came to us looking for a way to be able to explore the inside of coral reefs. And I'll do a quick plug for Mother Nature here. Uh, coral reefs are incredible and very worthy of fascination. They represent just 1% of the ocean seafloor, but are home to 25% of all marine life. Uh, coral is alive, and it's really a keystone for ocean ecology. Uh, the sad reality is that there's also a race against time here um, with coral reef collapse and bleaching events. Uh, so we not only want to prevent those, but we want to understand their mechanisms to help um, look at potential mitigations. However, exploring a coral reef is a non-trivial challenge. It is a complex, dense, 
unmapped three-dimensional space um, with tight cavities and abrasive, basically abrasive uh, properties. Um, at a similar time as we were starting to look at this exploration, some great research was coming out of Stanford here in Vine Robots. Um, and we saw this as a potential solution for really a few key properties. Uh, first is a simple deployment mechanism. So you're just controlling the spool, uh, the length of the spooled material, um, and then applying pressure. Uh, and then additionally, it has an ability to squeeze itself through tight spaces and self-navigate through cluttered terrain. So we basically built an underwater version. Um, we did a few things. We uh, have our motor and electronics inside of an internal waterproof housing. And then we have this larger uh, water flooded housing where we're basically just pumping in ambient water from around the environments. So we're using uh, the resources that are already there uh, and leveraging that to drive the growth of the robot. You can see we maintain um, a very flexible, soft device. Uh, this is done at, less, at low pressures, less than 3 PSI. Um, you can see even just sitting there in the tank, it's basically deforming under the small currents that it created. Um, you can also see it's uh, too soft to basically support itself. Once you apply a retract load, it buckles and um, curls itself up. Of course, in free space, this isn't so much of an issue. Uh, because once buckled, it'll then proceed with its retraction. Um, and in a confined passageway, this buckling doesn't occur, which uh, led us to a few interesting small studies, which is that, again, the point of this work was to interact with its environment. And what we find is, of course, that, I mean, really what you're dealing with are inflatable beams, and they have two main modes of buckling, either through axial loads or radial loads. Both have a strong dependency on the length of the, um, the beam. Um, but the overall length of the beam is not all that matters. What really matters is the length of the beam since its last support or constraint. Uh, so again, this lends itself well to operation in cluttered and crowded environments is that if you are interacting with the environment and that environment is causing to reinforce the structure of the robot itself, you can leverage that to support payloads over larger distances than you could in free space. There's one other problem as well, which is that in an ideal situation, you'd be able to navigate through a very cluttered space. Um, but in reality, if, especially if you're doing this in open loop, you have to face the challenge of trajectory condensation. So uh, if you know what the environment looks like, you can either pre-program or control around uh, obstacles. Um, but especially, again, in open loop, you don't have that ability. So you're just going to run into obstacles and basically grow along them until you depart. And what this does is it takes the infinite space of potential starting trajectories and condenses them all down to a single, um, basically, trajectory leaving that obstacle. Uh, and this motivated us to look at um, how can you solve that problem and still potentially navigate a coral reef space in open loop. Uh, my work here start, coincided with the start of the pandemic. So again, motivating flexibility and being able to pivot to a computational approach to this problem. Um, so we looked at basically recursive branching as a solution to this. So um, you know, a, a path might be growing down a, a passageway that's going to end up in a dead end. But if you are deploying new material at new angles, you basically are able to avoid this trajectory condensation because you're not relying entirely on the obstacles that you've already hit. The other thing that looking at branching does is it gives us a richer design space so we actually can um, attempt to optimize and, and improve our ability to explore an environment during the design phase, which uh, again saves important resources and effort when in the field because that operations phase, if you're underwater and have a, a diver on a fixed uh, supply of air, um, becomes a much more precious resource. Uh, so to, to do this and try to improve our performance on uncert, unknown environments, we looked at can you train on known examples and then use that, uh, basically learn something fundamental about the environment, improve your performance, and then see that performance improvement um, hold steady even when you do go to a deploy in the field. Uh, towards that, we basically set a two different um, simulated environments, a, a grid and a cave uh, example environment. Um, and you do see basically specialization of uh, these optimized designs um, on each environment. So uh, 
they were trained on a uh, training set, and then they carry over that specialization and show each their own, um, uh, each, each design that was trained on one environment then performs the best on the same uh, training uh, evaluation environment. Here you can see just a visualization of the optimization process. So this is generation 1, 10, 100, and 400 of an evolutionary algorithm. Um, we rewarded coverage. We basically treated this as a sensor uh, uh, distribution problem. So we wanted each end of the robot to end up in as unique a location as possible to try to cover the entire space while penalizing overall um, length of the robots. So we wanted to do a material minimization um, as a heuristic for simplicity. Uh, and here you just see basically snapshots of the design um, across generations all plotted on the same uh, evaluation map. Towards the end of this project, we were able to get back in the lab and do a little bit of hardware imp implementation. We worked on fabricating. How do you actually take these optimized designs and then turn them into a manufacturable design? I will say that uh, prototyping and building uh, branching vine robots remains to be a challenge. If anyone solves it, please do let me know. Um, we did get some progress, uh, had a lot of fun doing it, but it, um, it is difficult just dealing with that amount of internal friction and material transfer especially over long distances. We also looked at a little bit of a uh, parallel property. Um, this is uh, basically if you're deploying material into an environment, um, and especially with the confirmation that you get from pressure and uh, expanding outwards into this constrained environment, it almost presents a new approach to gripping um, through anchoring. So here you can see um, Basically, a, a vine robot growing into a constrained space. Uh, it works best if you're in a you know, tube that matches the diameter. Um, but even, again, a cluttered space with branching uh, shows a similar property where you're able to wrap and deploy around objects. Um, and despite a very low pressure uh, and growth, just, again, that large amount of friction over a, a large area, um, it's much more about what you can do to deploy the system rather than the strength that it um, needs to do that. And we took this and further exploited it, making uh, an anchor, a small pouch anchor that you can use to actually, well, don't use this to rock climb, but we show at least it can support a human off um, a very small initial volume of air. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about two of my projects at JPL. Um, you're going to see that there's a similar trend here, um, focusing on uh, simplicity for these extreme environments. They have a little bit different of a flavor, um, and they're both focused on really quite cold environments. So the first is Cold Arm. Uh, this is a project in partnership with Motive Space Systems and led by Ryan McCormick at JPL. Uh, but this is motivated really by um, the thermal power consumption that it takes to maintain operations in cold environments. So, uh, if you have robotics arm, robotic arms that go to cryogenic environments, which is common, um, you know, Mars at night is a balmy minus 90 Celsius. The moon gets way colder, uh, down to below minus 150 Celsius. And at those temperatures, um, you, know, you have to commit a lot of power just to surviving the environment. Um, but even when it's slightly better than that, uh, you still have to expend a lot of power just to heat your actuators. Um, keep lubricants moving, things like that. Uh, so similar to a lot of the gecko-inspired uh, adhesive projects, this started as a material science and, and really more fundamental approach, um, looking at bulk metallic glasses. So uh, you know, glasses we think of normally having a crystalline structure, but if you use uh, amorphous metals, which you can get through certain heat treatments and processes, um, they're actually able to maintain their uh, elasticity and, and flexibility down to very cold temperatures, which of course has advantages for space where we're operating at those cold temperatures. Um, there's been a lot of great uh, fundamental research on how do you take these kinds of materials and actually um, work with them and turn them into useful parts. Uh, a lot of the things we like to do to make parts, like forming them, uh, extruding them, molding them, all involve heat, uh, even cutting, right, just the friction of that can generate heat. And because the, the heat that you generate during uh, manufacturing really impacts this um, material structure, there's a lot of interesting challenges here. 
You can see this is a uh, basically gear set for a gear or for a small motor, and then here's an entire harmonic gearbox that's been previously submerged in a liquid nitrogen bath, so down at minus 180, um, still happily spinning and flexing um, down that cold. Here you can see our robotic arm in a uh, simulated test bed. Um, so basically this is a, oh, is the video stuttering? Well, hopefully that resolves itself. The, uh, the arm was smoother than the video, I'll tell you that much. Uh, <laughs> but there's you know, two points that I want to bring up here. First is the challenge of um, you know, designing things for space and right, using the materials, having to do uh, much more custom, um, and having to you know, uh, build things from scratch when you, know, you can't go to uh, a commercial company and buy an arm off the shelf. Um, and then using your ground data station as you would if you didn't have a, a great telecommunication link. Um, the other thing that I like to highlight here is the ingenuity of scientists themselves. So again, uh, the motivation for a lot of these operations in extreme environments is the science that you can achieve here. Um, and we'll see if, oh yeah, there's the arm working a little bit better, or the video working a little bit better. Uh, so you can see here, it's a pretty simple end effector. It's basically a, a scoop and a pressure plate. Um, but even through that, we're able to collect uh, valuable data. So by scooping and, and piling that um, regolith into, a, uh, into the same location, you can actually measure the angle of repose. Uh, similarly, by just pushing into the surface with a known load that we have through our force torque sensor and feedback, um, you're able to learn a lot about the properties of regolith. So, uh, I really just want to highlight, if, if you're able to get to these extreme environments, um, even small actions and small studies, you're able to still back out a tremendous amount of information just simply because getting there in the first place can be quite difficult. Oh, that was two slides. Uh, here you can see us. This was um, a test we just completed earlier this month, uh, so I don't have the videos from it yet. But we do have at least our setup pictures of us loading um, the arm into a seven-foot thermal vacuum chamber down at JPL. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you know the, the reality is, of course, that testing is a huge part of anything we do before we send it to space. You really do want to burn down as much of the risk and uncertainty as you can uh, before you commit to sending something out that you won't be able to service and maintenance. Um, this test did complete successfully, so uh, we showed the uh, elbow joint, which was one of these amorphous uh, metal bulk metallic glass joints, um, operating down to minus 150 Celsius, which to my knowledge is the coldest robotic arm uh, operations <laughs> that, that I've heard of. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn to uh, one of my final projects here, which is called Ice Node. Um, so Ice Node is a, actually I'll, I'll stay here for a little bit. Ice Node is a fairly large um, drifting robotic vehicle. It's focused on uh, being able to drift underneath ice shelves over long distances and for long periods of time. And you might ask, why are we trying to do that? Uh, the real answer is that we're trying to uh, reduce the uncertainty on sea level rise projections. Um, so again, I'm going to go into a little bit of the science motivation of this here. Um, but there are these very large error bars on predicted global mean sea level rise. Uh, and a lot of that uncertainty comes from basically glaciers that are sitting on top of Greenland and especially Antarctica. So these glaciers are all basically ice that's locked above sea level, um, currently happily sitting in, in ice form, uh, that is slowly flowing out to sea and then um, once it hits the water, uh, raises sea level. And the reason that it's flowing is because it these size scales, ice is not really like a solid. It's almost like a, a honey material. It's this uh, slow, viscoelastic process uh, flowing into the, the water. And this process is slowed by these, um, basically, ice shelves that effectively buttress um, these glaciers and slow that flow of ice out into the water. Uh, these ice shelves are experiencing rapid deterioration and collapse, and we have a you know, there's a lot of great people studying this, but um, still a poor understanding of some of the mechanisms and uh, mechanics of these collapses. 
And the reason for that is because studying them is incredibly difficult, um, potentially over uh, very dangerous places. You know, you don't want to be out there when these um, uh, sea ice shelves are basically breaking up or moving. Um, so again, unstable, uh, extremely cold, remote locations. Um, and additionally, some of the best data where the melt is actually occurring is not on top of the ice, it's underneath the ice, because you have this warm water coming from underneath. Um, but again, focusing on simplicity and how do you take the things that are there in the environment and use that to inform the design, uh, that warm water that's causing um, this melt is actually also a free ride for the vehicle, so very efficient in terms of energy. You basically have this uh, current flow where you have warm water um, coming in along the sea floor, and then it basically is uh, rising up, contacting the ice shelf that is causing some melts. So the water temperatures then cool and then flow back out to sea. And so that gives us an approach to um, effectively drift in. So we have, again, as I mentioned, the only real continuous uh, degree of freedom that we have is our own buoyancy of the, of the systems. So we have a small oil-filled bladder that we can use to either um, pump oil inside or outside of the vehicle, thereby changing its volume and changing whether or not we're going to uh, sink or rise. Using that, we can pair with uh, projections and estimates of um, these three-dimensional currents, basically pick what height or altitude we want to be at, ride particular currents in, um, and try to distribute a fleet of ice nodes across uh, an ice shelf. Once we reach the point that we want to deploy, we have a heavy ballast that we can drop. This is a pyrotechnically severed device, and we drop um, this ballast, which then shoots the vehicle up to land on the ice. We have these three compliant arms that basically uh, hold us steady. This is important because the science measurements that we're taking are measuring. Um, it's basically sensing these small turbulent eddies. So as uh, the ice is melting, you have cold water flowing down and creating these small eddies. And you need to be very still to be able to actually sense those. After a period of months, then, um, it's hard to transmit data from beneath you know, a, a lot of ice. So, the approach there is then to be able to detach from those legs and from an extra set of flotation, return to a state of neutral buoyancy, and then when we're at that neutral buoyancy, again, we can control uh, whether we're positive or negative through that variable buoyancy engine. Um, and then once we're back out, ride the current back out to the open water and return the data. Here you can see um, some of the system functions in a uh, tank test that we did in San Diego. Uh, in this case, our vehicle was better than the camera used to take the, the video. Um, but here we're just checking out, going through a uh, range of set points for uh, depth control. Next, you're going to see us landing on our ice shelf. Um, it is, of course, difficult to find natural ice in San Diego, especially in the summer. So we had to use a plywood proxy. Um, so here you see us basically severing this ballast and then launching up and landing on the ice. Um, we have, again, these compliant legs that are spring-loaded to be able to react and absorb any of the differences in uh, ice that we see. And then there's one more view that'll show basically the weight clearing the instrument panel on the bottom. And then finally, as I mentioned, we have a detachment at the end. This serves uh, two purposes. First is, as I mentioned, we need to be able to return to neutral buoyancy. So we have a lot of ballast that we need, or sorry, buoyancy that we need to get rid of. And then the second is actually that there's a risk here of being able to melt the vehicle um, somewhat up into the ice. So as I mentioned, there's warm water that's causing the melting uh, flowing. And if that flows over the vehicle, the vehicle might heat up just ever so slightly um, relative to the ice that it's landed on. And then even no matter what steps we take to minimize uh, thermal conductivity, um, if the vehicle is, is warmer than the ice, it's going to want to basically slowly melt up. So we actually basically included the legs in the part of the vehicle that we uh, sever. Yes, yeah, so we include the legs in the piece that we sever. Uh, we rely on the buoyancy of the foam to basically keep those pieces all separate, and we've simultaneously set the uh, buoyancy engine to be, uh, for the vehicle to be heavy. So once we detach, again, pyrotechnically, uh, detach the top cap, um, you're going to see the vehicle just uh, sink down and, and drift out from the bottom. Um,
this is again the landing, and we'll see the next slide in just a minute. So is it is it is it always the case that the like the bottom surface is flat for your application? No, we do have um basically an upward looking instrument so we can see a little bit of uh, the ice properties and again those legs are each individually compliant and spring loaded so they have the ability to conform up to some level of roughness of the ice. So again, a, a big focus here is on simplicity. We have one real degree of freedom and then two pyrotechnically severed devices, and that's really the, the only control we need over the vehicle itself. Uh, because plywood doesn't tell you a lot of scientific instrument or information, we still wanted to bring it out into the field and test there. Um, here we are doing a deployment up in the upper peninsula of Michigan. Uh, we drilled a borehole through um, ice on Lake Superior. This was frozen over and uh, part of it was frozen over in March. Um, and we took data for a period of a couple days. Uh, there's not a lot of interesting uh, melt data that you're going to see in this kind of environment, but it at least let us check out both the vehicle functionality overall as well as our science instrument. We could see some of the um, you know, small currents just from the area. Yeah, go ahead. So there's no real concern about catching like an ice ledge with one of the legs and that flipping your instrument on its side? Yeah, so we do have upward facing instruments to basically try to track um, what that ice surface would look like. Uh, so do you have any thrusters or ways to adapt once you sense that information? Or? It would be um, don't. So we would uh, basically rise through the VBS to a, you know, a standoff distance of 30 meters below the ice, at which point, if the ice looks good, you can sever the ballast, and if not, you would keep drifting and then sever it a little bit later when you're on a friendlier landing terrain. Uh, this is actually a perfect transition because I'm uh, at the end of my slides. I want to thank um, both everyone who contributed to uh, my work from my PhD and especially um, my two projects at JPL had a huge number of collaborators. Um, both of these were started before I joined, uh, so a lot of people to thank there. Um, as well as, of course, the research here at Stanford that I've been fortunate to be able to collaborate with. Um, so thank you all for your time and attention. I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Yeah, go ahead. I'm just curious, with the branching inflatable robot, did you guys try to take it to a standard rock climbing gym and see what it could do? Uh, <laughs> no, I don't think that the branching would have been that helpful for a rock climbing gym. Um, because it really benefits from constrained spaces and then the friction that you get wrapping around an obstacle. Um, that was really, so I, I do a little bit of rock climbing as a hobby on the side, and that was really the motivation for a standalone um, pouch anchor, right? So uh, if we, yeah, basically, right, in rock climbing, they use a lot of cams, so carefully placed, uh, you know, things where basically as you put them in the rock, the harder you pull, the more outwards they push which is a, a great solution and, again, much safer than, than just using an inflatable bag. But if you're doing something like perching with a flying robot, it's potentially easier to just shove something inside of a cavity or empty space and then expand outwards to fill it rather than you know, some of the more traditional approaches of looking for a place that you can carefully grip or you know, and requiring the dexterity that goes along with that approach. So um, it was really looking at, you know, in part, a simple um, simple anchoring approach. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a last one. So um, like in your example in for the underwater applications, are you able to like, uh, like re-portray it after you retract it? Uh, for which one? For the aversion? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so again, it depends a little bit for the branching. Um, that's part of the reason we looked at anchoring uh, with branching is because once you've deployed into that space, it's not easy to recover um, all those different branches. Uh, for the single, you know, 
buy in robot, um, you are, you have, we basically maintain uh, the extra material on the, the tether reel at the back and are able to retract that just by pulling. So a different answer for the two systems. For the ladder and are you able to like to reproduction, like redeploy into the space after you retract? Uh, yeah, for the, the main one, yeah, you could. Okay. Great. Well, thank you all so much.